let's take a final look at my power rankings after 10 weeks of regular season football. So we're going to start at number eight and go all the way up to one. And number eight and number seven are really significant this week more than any other week. Because at number eight, I got the Houston Roughnecks who finished the season one and nine. Couldn't couldn't get a second win this year. And, and frankly, it hurts on two occasions. One, you lose to the Memphis Showboats who until they beat you were one and eight, and they're now in the number seven spot. But the reason that it's significant in the UFL is we don't have a toilet bowl in the UFL. We be playing for keeps, right? So the worst teams were playing this week for the opportunity to have the number one overall pick and the number one pick in each subsequent round of the 2025 UFL draft. So there's absolutely stakes. You're trying to make your roster better. You got to go win the game to do that or be guaranteed that opportunity to have the first pick in 2025. And the Memphis Showboats were able to do it, so they're up at seven, right? I think that it's been difficult for John Filippo's squad all year long. In this game, he actually gave up the play call and privileges, gave those to Doug Martin, who had a rapport with Josh Love, who got the start, and did enough for them to win the game. Darius Victor also had two TDs in that game, and this puts a bow on Memphis for me. Darius Victor was the 2022 USFL Offensive Player of the Year when he was a New Jersey general. And it's because he could get into the end zone. This year, he had one multi-rush TD game, and that was the final game of the season to get them their second victory and secure that number one pick for them. So, again... I thought it was going to be much better than it was given the roster, given what John Filippo was able to do with the New Orleans Breakers before becoming the head coach of Memphis Showboats. Just didn't go that way. Number six on the list, I had the D.C. Defenders who finished the season four and six after going nine and one last year. And for me, it was twofold. They couldn't stop anybody on defense, right? One of the worst scoring defenses in the league, even with Greg Williams giving us outstanding sound bites. And they couldn't protect the quarterback because when Jordan Tomu was upright and moving around and making things happen, he was good as, as good as any quarterback in the league, full stop. He just did not have a run game, and he didn't have a consistent receiving core that could help pick him up. He had some plays, and they made some plays, but you're going to be able to stop people and or run the ball if you're trying to win, or going to win, I should say. And they, they just couldn't get it done against the Arlington Renegades, who I have at number five because they finally got that win over the D.C. defenders. Now, the thing about the Renegades is I thought that this was a talented team on paper to start the season, and I think still think it is. It's just games would get away from them. Either the defense would completely let them down or the offense wouldn't keep up its end. And this one, they avenged a one-point loss to the defenders with a one-point win at Audi Field. It's a great way to go out. Also got to feel good about winning your last three straight if you're Bob Stoops and winning uh, three out of four, I should say. Um yeah, three out of four, not your last three straight, but two wins. So three out of your last four after getting off to such a horrible start and really not being in the XFL playoff picture at all in a year in which, well, you're defending the legacy XFL championship. And I thought that perhaps they were going to make just a little bit more of a run, but they finished three and seven this year, but ahead of the defenders in the power ranking. So that's something, right? And then number four on the list, I have our first of four playoff teams. That's the San Antonio Brahmas, who finished the season at seven and three. And really have shown they are a defensive-minded team. And they take great pride in their defense. Like, that's the number one scoring defense in the league. And no surprise, Wade, D, uh, Wade Phillips, who is a defensive-minded head coach, has seen a lot to that, right? Jordan Mosley's been playing outstanding when he's been on the field. They've had really great runs uh, of keeping people scoreless. And against the St. Louis Battlehawks last week, I thought maybe they were going to be able to do a magic trick, which is to go into a place that routinely has 34,000 people screaming at you and maybe steal a win so they can get the right to host the XFL championship game. But it didn't go that way. So now they got to go back to St. Louis to play against the Battle Hawks and what is probably going to be a more raucous atmosphere than the one they played in last week because there's a championship on the line with this one. But I also think Jason Garber's going out early. Didn't help their fortunes for San Antonio. You had Quentin Dormady, who was coming in after being the midseason starter, having to run back to the sideline to get the play call because he couldn't hear A.J. Smith at his headset. That's how lo loud it is at the Dome at America Center in St. Louis. And really just couldn't get into a rhythm. But more than that, the defense played well enough to win. They could not run the ball. 
And that's that's a problem for San Antonio. Now, they didn't have John Lovett or Anthony McFarland, their two best tailbacks, in that game against St. Louis. Maybe getting them back this weekend changes your fortunes running the ball. And if they're able to run the ball, it's not a 13-12 to 12 loss. Perhaps it's even a win for them. So they're going to have to do this. And in the best circumstances, play two more games in St. Louis. You don't want to have to go there. Uh, excuse me. You don't want to go there and lose this game, obviously. But you also don't want to go there and lose it the way that you did last week. Find a different way to lose it, right? And hope that you can get your run game going. Number three on the list, I got the St. Louis Battlehawks, who got that win and have the right to host the XFL championship game. It also means that St. Louis gets to play at home for the entirety of the playoffs. And I, I'm i struggling to find a corollary for that in professional football, let alone high school football. Like, you know, we would be livid if we had to go to somebody's home stadium to play for a state championship. Sure, it happens, but we'd still be mad about it. And because of the nature of the UFL, and because this was a site that was set before the season start, it's just the way that it is, right? Every now and again, you know, a Super Bowl team has the opportunity to play at home if they make it to the Super Bowl. Next year's in New Orleans. If the Saints could do it, they would do it. But being able to play back to back, that's unheard of uh, for me, right? Like, I just, I don't know that we have ever seen that. So St. Louis ought to take advantage of that. And Anthony Beck has already put out the call. He's like, everybody in the city of St. Louis needs to show up to the Dome on Saturday or Sunday, excuse me, when they play the San, San Antonio Brahmas because having that 12th man was really important for the Battle Hawks. They were just upsetting the offense for San Antonio that wanted to go fast, that wanted to do his run and shoot, and wanted to be able to get in and out of its play calls and just couldn't do it. I think A.J. McCarron would love to play a better game than he did against the battle, uh, excuse me, against the Brahmas in his first game back from injury. He did not look good. Uh, Hakeem Butler, who is the best wide receiver in the league, didn't look good either. If not for Julian Sailors, I'm not sure what the offense might have been able to do at all. I should say Julian Sailors and Wayne Gallman. So let's say the run game against the Brahmas. Again, uh, it's going to be the same defense and you're going to need the Battlehawk defense to step up and do what it did. Because I think if the game continues to go the way that it did last week where you're talking about 13 versus 12, that plays more to the San Antonio Brahmas because they're going to come in there with Quentin Dormady probably as the starter. And they're going to return their, their running backs. You're going to have to show up and, and move the football if you are the St. Louis Battle Hawks. Number two on the list, I have the Michigan Panthers who looked every bit like doubling up the, excuse me, not doubling up, but handing a second straight loss to the Birmingham Stallions at protective. Danny Etling, Look like a dude out there for the first time all year. I looked at Danny Edling going, okay, that might actually be one of the better quarterbacks in our league. That said, they had a 16 to six lead. The Birmingham Stallion offense looked bad. Adrian Martinez looked the worst he'd looked all year. The Birmingham defense didn't look like it could stop anybody, especially seam routes. It just looked like their zone coverage was getting picked apart. And then in the third, fourth quarter, Skip Holtz, Adrian Martinez, they figured it out. They gave themselves an opportunity to take a lead at the end, and then Jake Bates missed what would have been the game winner from 53 yards and handed not just the number one seed, but the USFL regular season championship to the Birmingham Stallions. Insult to injury on this one. They were already going to have to play in protective because of scheduling conflict at Ford Field if they were the number one seed. That said, you would love to have known that you got that win and that it doesn't really matter because... Well, Protective Stadium has not had the atmosphere that, say, St. Louis has, but that's still a tough team to put away. And they showed tremendous backbone in being able to pull out a win in a game that, frankly, you're playing for pride if you're Birmingham. You you don't want to show everything you have because you have the playoff spot and you want to get healthy to go win a game that absolutely matters so you can get to play in St. Louis for the inaugural UFL championship. But the Panthers... Show me a great defense. I think Jake Bates is going to make that kick in the future. Uh, I think he's betting his NFL future on it. And if Danny Etling can play the way that he played against in the first half, they're good. Now, again, injuries are happening to everybody, and they want to get healthy at other spaces. But they showed that they can beat the Birmingham Stallions. They just didn't finish. Now they got to show that they can finish. Number one, I got 9-1 and one Birmingham Stallions. Like it's it, it, full stop. Like for the second straight year, Skip Holtz goes 9-1 and one the regular season. He's able to find a quarterback that everybody else might think is damaged goods and turn that guy into an MVP caliber quarterback. He's got stalwarts on that offense and that defense. That staff is outstanding. I'm still picking them to win the UFL championship, and I think that they're going to get tested by the Panthers. But 
it feels like we're at the beginning of a dynasty. And I'm working on a story about Birmingham and how this thing has come together over three years. Really excited about that. Look for that later this week on FoxSports.com. Talk with a bunch of uh, different people, get a lot of different views about why it works at Birmingham and what has made it more difficult and also more impressive what Skip Holtz has done in just three years as being a professional football head coach. If you like what you've seen, consider subscribing to the number one college football show on YouTube, the Fox Sports app, or wherever you get your podcast.